and welcome to the Book Club Review, the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Are you wondering what to read next? Tired of seeing the same old suggestions? A bit bored of the latest must-reads in the weekend papers? Well, I sat down with Anna Bailey Karras of Australian podcast Books on the Go, who gave me a ton of recommendations, most of which I'd never even heard of, including a book so good it has all of Australia buzzing. Intrigued? Then listen on. We began by talking about how Books on the Go got started. We used to have a TV show in Australia called The First Tuesday Book Club. I loved that show. There was so much love for that show and that ended. It was just that wanting something where you could tune into a book discussion. So we read a book each week and my co-hosts are Annie Waters and Amanda Hayes and they alternate. It works as a sort of virtual book club. If you've read the book... You know, you can read along with us and then tune into the discussion. Or if you haven't read it, you'll get an idea of if it's something you want to read. And we talk a bit about book news, things that are happening in the industry, awards, things like that. And they sometimes give us ideas for books. We read a wide range of fiction, non-fiction. We've tended to read a bit more contemporary fiction just because we find that is what everyone's talking about and it's nice to tune in and engage with that discussion. Did you have connections to the literary world? Do any of you work in publishing or anything like that or were you all just keen readers? Annie is a bookseller. She manages a store called Mostly Books in Adelaide. Oh, great. Amanda and I both former lawyers but Amanda had been living in Hong Kong and she'd been involved with the Hong Kong Literary Festival over there. Adelaide has a literary festival, doesn't it? Yes, it has Adelaide Writers Week, which is a fabulous event. It's held in the first week of March as part of the Adelaide Festival. We had a very busy week this year because we were able to meet with some of the authors who were here and interview them for the podcast, which was really fun. So we chatted with Rebecca Mackay, who has the book The Great Believers, which just won the Carnegie Medal for Fiction. I think it was on the shortlist for the Pulitzer Prize. Mm. It's a really beautiful book. It's set in Chicago in the 1980s during the AIDS crisis, and then it flips to Paris in current day but it's a very generous, lovely book. I was just about to say it sounds familiar and then I remembered, I think it's familiar because I listened to your show and I heard you talking about it. I was like, I'm sure someone's told me about that when it was you. (laughs) And Oyin Khan Braithwaite with my sister, the serial killer. So we had a lovely chat with her. She was just delightful. So we just decided to do that for my book club last night. I was talking about it with some friends because it's just been shortlisted for the Women's Prize and we were saying it's a good book club pick because it's short and Mm. so everyone will be able to read it. But it does repay because the thing with the Women's Prize is that they have to reread these books. Even though it's deceptively short and a quick read, it's very pacey, Mm. it actually would repay rereading and I think a book club discussion It'll be interesting to see how your book club goes with it. It's fitting in with our program because we decided to read War and Peace. Oh, yes. On the other end of the spectrum. So the strategy is to have this ticking over in the background and then we're going to read some short books for our kind of regular get-togethers. So, yeah, My Sister the Serial Killer hopefully will fit in in well. (laughs) Yeah, good on you doing War and Peace. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. It really enhances your appreciation of a book, doesn't it, when you do get to talk to the author and hear their perspective on it. But at the same time, how do you then navigate that kind of critical side? I always think that's a slightly tricky balance. Good question. We actually only approached authors where we knew that we loved the book. Mm. And another one which I was going to talk about as well is We That Are Young by Preeti Taneja, Mm. which we absolutely loved. But yes, there were a number of authors who we either weren't interested in reading the book or we didn't like it. Yeah. And so <laughs> just to avoid that awkward situation. <laughs> that would be awkward. Because so, it's tricky sometimes, isn't yeah. it? You know, you want to be, I suppose, balanced and fair. Mm. But sometimes, sometimes you do feel like you want to be critical. And yet I always think anyone who's able to write a book, how extraordinary is that? You I know. know. that kind of yeah, who are Ballad. we to say? Yes, oh, well, but then on the be. other hand, if it didn't really do it for you, then yeah, that's what I love about book clubs because they feel like you can get all that out, and that's it's right. like a safe space. Yes. And we've extended that slightly, haven't we? <laughs> in that we've taken it onto the internet. Yes. <laughs> nonetheless, tell me about the Australian literary scene at the minute. What are people talking about? We've been noticing a bit of a rise in non-fiction, mm. and mm. we've had some of 
the non-fiction titles of The Trauma Cleaner by Sarah Krasnostein. That was just shortlisted for the Welcome Book Prize that was announced last night. We have the Stella Prize for Women's Writing, which can be fiction or non-fiction, and the last two years that's gone to non-fiction titles. This year, the Stella Prize went to The Erratics by Vicky Laveau Harvey, which is a memoir about her going back to see her parents in Canada. So there seems to be a lot of non-fiction doing well. Another one is No Friend But The Mountains by Beruz Buchani, which is has won a number of awards, including the Victorian Premier's Literary Award, which is a significant award. He is writing from Manus Island, where Australia processes or detains Mm. asylum seekers, Mm. and they sort of detain them indefinitely. And so he's written this book via WhatsApp messages, and it's then been translated. So he's just had a mobile phone and sent messages to a person in Sydney. It's then been translated. He won this award. He couldn't be there to accept it because he's still on Manus Island. So that has really resonated. It's quite a harrowing, very harrowing read, actually. Mm. And I suppose in fiction, there's been rural crime. Mm. So authors like Jane Harper, who does it really well, she sets her books in the outback and the landscape really becomes part of the story. So The Dry, which is now being adapted into a film with Eric Banner and her latest one, The Lost Man, which we did on the podcast Mm. and really liked. We Mm. thought that was stronger than The Dry. Oh, right. I like The Dry. The Dry was the first of the Aaron Falk series where he's the police officer Mm. and then Force of Nature is the second one, which also has Aaron Falk and The Lost Man is a standalone. Really, really good Mm. and lots going on in that book as well. Tell me about some of the books that you've done for the show. Are there any particular books that kind of stand out as the ones that you just loved so much and you want to push into people's hands? Yes, there are. There are probably too many for the podcast, but we That Are Young by Preeti Tanaja, which I mentioned, mm. that was a case of we had not heard of Preeti Tanaja. She came out for Adelaide Writers Week and we were really intrigued to read the book and we absolutely loved it. So it's a modern day retelling of King Lear set in India. She adheres quite faithfully to the play, which I haven't read, but I loved it even not I mean, I'm familiar with King Lear, but not having read King Lear or even seen King Lear, Mm. I was able to love it. I think you'd get even more out of it if you were more familiar with the play. But it is on one level just an amazing, lively Bollywood saga and family sort of epic story. But on another level, it has all the tragedy and comedy as well. She has a great sense of humour, but it shows the wealth and poverty in India really well. And there are lots of references that she just weaves in without making it explicit. It's quite a long one, but worth it. Yeah, it so sounds great. I want to read that right now. Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> fabulous. And I feel like it's a bit underrated mm. or under the radar, but she's amazing. And Asymmetry by Lisa Halliday, that came out I think late last year Lisa Halliday had worked in publishing and when she was in her 20s had a relationship with Philip Roth Mm. when he was about in his 70s she's now sort of married with children about 40 so she's very much moved on from that but they remained friends up until his death and she's drawn on that for this book and that's really all I knew when I went in and I thought oh it'll be one of those I'm using my sort of associations or my story to kind of make that into a novel. And it blew me away. Mm. It was so exquisite. It's written in two parts and a coda. So the first part is a young publishing employee, you know, young woman working in publishing who has an affair with a much older but famous and revered author who she names Ezra, I think. So she doesn't use Philip Roth, but it's clearly based on. So you get this very voyeuristic, Mm. this fly on the wall idea of what that might have been like. So he's a bit older, so he's got her, you know, stopping off at Zabar's to buy medical supplies and things like that. And they sit together and watch the baseball and order pizza. And it's very intimate. It all takes place in his apartment, really. Mm. And that is just a wonderful, engaging and really interesting story. You know, you wonder what she's going to do. Where Mm. is that going to go? Mm. And it's just told with a light touch, but really, really intelligent, good writing. But then the second part, 
heart is, I've forgotten his name, is it Amar? He is an Iraqi economist who lives in the UK. He's going back to Iraq to see his brother and he gets detained at Heathrow and there's almost this Kafka-esque thing and that's told in quite a different style but really engaging and he gets detained just because of his passport really and they hold him in this holding room and they sort of go off and say we need to make some general inquiries. While they're doing that he's reflecting back on his life so you get his story and at first you think it's completely different from the first part but there are so many parallels and so there's a lot more to it Mm. and then the coda is the older author who appears as a guest on Desert Island Discs and it is on one level I found it hysterically funny like I was laughing out loud Mm. but on another level well just interesting because he's an older man and he sort of ends up propositioning the host of Desert Island Discs. (laughs) National treasure. (laughs) <laughs> and I found that really funny, but you could also think, well, is that, you know, is that appropriate? Yeah. And yeah. So I just think there's so much to it yeah. and I thoroughly enjoyed it. The Museum of Modern Love by Heather Rose, which won, and I was late to this party. It won the Stella Prize, I think in 2017. And I knew a few people who read it and loved it. And mm. for some reason I bought it, but I hadn't got to it yet. And I read it last year. We did it for the podcast. I think that was episode 40. I just loved it more than I expected to. Isn't it nice when that happens? I know. (laughs) It's basically inspired by Marina Abramovich, who did the piece of performance art at MoMA in Mm. New York called The Artist is Present. And that involved her sitting at a table and people could come and sit opposite her for 15 minutes and they were asked not to speak or do anything but just to sit there and look at her. And she sat there for 75 days. And so it was inspired by that and Mm. it doesn't fictionalise it. So it's very much about Marina and pays homage to her, really. But the story is Arky, who's a musician, and he's a self-obsessed, self-absorbed, unlikable character, living in New York, trying to compose divine music and struggling with that. And his wife has left, and he goes along to see this art, this performance, and that sort of ends up changing him. So it's really that story. And I... I mean, I have to say, reading the blurb, that wouldn't have appealed to me Mm. necessarily Mm. because you feel like there's not much going on and it was fabulous. Mm. So I really recommend that. I think that's available in the UK. Um, I'm hesitant now to say, yes, that sounds familiar because I'm... (laughs) Yeah. Do I just know this because I've heard you talking about it? <laughs> I know. But, uh, so, it definitely sounds like something yeah. to seek out. The Museum of Modern Love and one more Australian standout for us, which has had so much love in Australia, is Boy Swallows Universe by Trent Dalton, mm. which we did in episode 28. He is an Australian journalist. This is his first novel and it's based on his real life. He says it's about 50-50 and how much is true. Mm. He's had an extraordinary upbringing, but it's this wonderful sort of rollicking novel where it's about two boys, Eli and his brother August, and they live with their mother and her boyfriend, who's a drug dealer in suburban Brisbane in the 1980s. Mm. One of their babysitters is Slim, who's an escaped convict. It's very colourful, and all the characters feel like they're larger than life or feel exaggerated, but they also ring true. He really captures people really well, and that sort of suburban Australia in the 1980s and the sort of TV shows and the bikes that kids rode and things like that. Down the road they have a Vietnamese family who have a restaurant but they're also involved in this drugs trade and then their mother gets taken to jail and it goes on from there. I don't want to spoil the story so much but there's so much heart in it. It's a really generous book. He's a very lively writer. Everything just feels really vivid and and alive and it's a very affectionate look at Australia it's not cynical and it's funny because 
when I read it, it's not a perfect novel, but I, like everyone, just sort of fell in love with it a bit. And then I found I was reading other Australian books and I kept comparing them to Boy Swallow's universe. So it, mm. it almost became a bit of a benchmark because it had life in it. And there have been some other books by highly regarded authors that I have found were too crafted and sort of dead on the page. You know mm. how that can happen mm. sometimes when mm. it's too worked on? Yeah, so that's been a real standout. That sounds great. Mm. I want to read all of these. Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem, isn't it? The shows of yours that I've listened to, generally speaking, you've, you've tended to both be quite enthusiastic about the book that you've been discussing. But have there been any ones where you've really had a big difference of opinion? Annie and I read An American Marriage by Tayari Jones mm. and Annie really loved it. She that's just, um, that's we, nominated for the Women's Prize, isn't it? Yes, that's just been shortlisted. So the story is Celestial and Ray who have been married about a year. He gets jailed for something he says he didn't do. They're a young, upwardly mobile black couple in the United States, in the, the southern state mm. there. And it's the story of what that does to their marriage, really. And they write letters to each other while he's in jail. And then there's another section after he comes out and how that unfolds. Mm. Annie thought it was really beautiful, really generous, warm, well-written and just a gorgeous book. And she could sort of really unpick lots of layers in it and felt for the characters and all the things that it was wanting to do hit home with her. And I I wanted to love it and I just <laughs> didn't. And I think I was expecting something different. I I thought it was more about the wrongful imprisonment mm. because I'd heard an interview with Tayari Jones saying that's what she wanted to look at and she ended up, she thought she might do a non-fiction book about that and she ended up coming to fiction. So I had that in my mind and actually the arrest which I thought would be the most dramatic moment, that thing that happens to them, is passed over quite quickly. I actually did have to go back and reread, hang on, has he been arrested? What did he get arrested for? How did that happen? Mm. And it's just passed over because she actually is focusing on their marriage. I found them unlikable. At the beginning they were arguing already so I didn't Ooh, that's ever a so I did not that that's you know that I can see that that is makes the book more nuanced and it, you know more realistic but it did make me think really I don't know that their marriage was going to survive anyway so I don't <laughs> know I didn't feel as invested in it or yeah. engaged as I would have liked to but I think that would be a great book club book well, yeah, actually because yeah. it does – I think it opens up lots of discussions. We're always trying to unpick what we think makes for a really good book club book. What's your take on it? What do you think? Yes, good question. I'm in an Adelaide book club in real life, which has been going for about 14 years. I was going to ask you, but then yeah. I thought, no, no, she won't be in a book club. She wouldn't have time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But you well, are. We've a... all become a bit time poor. So that feeds into what book you can choose. But the Adelaide one, we have no parameters. We've read just about everything. Mm. Fiction, non-fiction. We've read Anna Karenina, mm. all sorts of things in terms of long books, short books. Interestingly, the London book club that I'm in, they set a page limit. It has to be under 500 pages. Mm. and I think, That's quite reasonable, I think. Yeah, for a book club. I, I think one of the factors, but this is interesting because your book club is doing War and Peace, but um, <laughs> it, very, yeah. very unusually. <laughs> yes. I think it has to be achievable depending on your book club. I think some book clubs at different stages of life, they're completely up for a 900 page or 600 page mm. book within the month but others may not be something that's not going to be so taxing that people struggle to get through it it's interesting isn't it because you want a book that will provoke discussion mm. so sometimes a shorter book can have a lot of layers to it and a lot to unpick we read ties by domenico starnoni which is a short book but there's so much going on in that book it's about a marriage breakdown and that one, even though it's, a, I think, only 140, 150 pages, there was a lot to unpick. Mm. It's no good, is it, if everyone just sort of sits back and says, yeah, that was great. Yeah, that's right. There has so to be more to it. It has to be not just a nice 
book. Mm. There mm. has to be something going on, a little bit of a challenge, even where some people will say, oh, it was too hard or it was too slow, I couldn't read it. But that in itself can be an interesting discussion. I think an American marriage would be a good book club choice mm. because it is thoughtful and intelligent and there are lots of issues going on there, but not everyone will necessarily love it. Great. There's so Mm. many fantastic suggestions. I haven't mentioned, but in terms of Australian reads, is Tim Winton, Mm. who is just a very beloved author. And We did Cloud Street for my book club a long time ago. And that was, I remember that being a really good book club book because I loved it and I think everyone else hated it. Oh, really? (laughs) I think so. Yeah. I think that's my memory. Some people don't get on with him. It was quite divisive. I love his writing. I love him. Um, we did Dirt Music for our Adelaide Book Club mm. and Breath. Breath is a shorter one. So in terms of coming to him, if perhaps Cloud Street was too long for some people. But his latest one, The Shepherd's Hut, is exquisite. I think he's surpassed himself with The Shepherd's Hut, mm. which I think is out now in the UK. So I, I should mention that because I, I'm sort of thinking more of – new authors or authors who you may not have heard of, whereas Tim Winton doesn't really need any more introduction. But, you know, it's easy to forget sometimes how good he is. It deals with toxic masculinity and it's got a protagonist, Jaxie, who's about a 15-year-old boy and he runs away from home. So he goes on a journey and he meets in sort of outback Western Australia a priest so it's an odd couple as well and it goes on from there it's comic the writing is exquisite and it's interesting Jaxi is uneducated so his vocabulary is not large and so Tim Winton had to really work with a limited vocabulary for the narration Mm. it's a fabulous read Amanda and I did it for the podcast Mm. and so people can find you on iTunes can't they and you have a website as well Yes, we're on, I think, all the podcast places and we're on Facebook at Books on the Go. I'm on Instagram at A. Bailey Karras and Twitter and Litzy at A. Bailey Karras. So they're the best ways to find us. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just buzzing with kind of ideas and things I want to go and look <laughs> at. And also, oh, you thank you for having me. Incredibly kind me. Brought me a couple of books. So I'm going to open them now. And do a big podcast reveal. (laughs) Oh, my God. Fresh in from Australia. I love to have my books imported for me in person by (laughs) by, by someone from Australia. I think (laughs) these are ones that you might... One, I think you can't get here. The other one you can now, I believe. It has just been released. But let's have a look. Ah, The Erratics, Vicky Lavo Harvey. Yes. So that's the one I mentioned, which just won the Stella Prize for women's writing in Australia. And it's fabulous. I've read it recently. A ferocious, sharp, darkly funny and wholly compelling memoir of families, the pain they can inflict and the legacy they leave. Great. Yeah. And what's the other one? Oh, this is so nice. What complete and utter treat. (laughs) Boys Wallace Universe. Great. I so want to read this. I know. I feel like it's a bit on the bandwagon because in Australia it's been so loved and had... And isn't that funny? I don't think anyone really knows about it So, yeah, that's right. I thought in Australia it doesn't need any more promotion, but at least here you may not have heard of it. Great. In fact, I am exactly between books as well. It's a very, very good moment because I've just finished my book club book and then... You know that thing you almost, when you're between books and you have a delicious moment where you're just kind of like, (sighs) what shall I read next? And then you dive into something and then that's it. You're not thinking about it anymore. But there's that little moment of pause. I'm in the moment of pause. So Mm. (laughs) perfect. Yeah. Oh, very good. Well, I hope you like them. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming. And what else can I say? Thank Um, you very much. So nice to talk to you in person. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for this episode. Check the show notes for a list of all Anna's book suggestions and a link to Books on the Go. On our next book club episode, we'll be discussing Milkman by Anna Burns. It's the 2018 Booker Prize winner, a tale of suffocating gossip, ever-present violence and one young woman's struggle to retain her sense of self during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. Remarkable novel by modern-day heir to Samuel Beckett? Or demanding snooze vest with not nearly enough paragraph breaks? The Booker judges may have loved it, but what did my book club think? listen in to find out. 
If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email the Book Club Review at gmail.com. And if you're not already, subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>